Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen that the Egyptians oppress them. Now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses answered, But look, they may not believe me or listen to me, but say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is in your hand? He said, A staff. And he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw the staff on the ground and it became a snake, and Moses drew back from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and seize it by the tail. So he reached out his hand and grasped it, and it became a staff in his hand, so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak, he put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, his hand was diseased as white as snow. Then God said, put your hand back into your cloak. So he put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his body. If they will not believe you or heed the first sign, they may believe the second sign. If they will not believe even these two signs or listen to you, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground, and the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor even now that you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who gives speech to mortals? Who makes them mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to speak. But he said, O oh my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, What of your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Even now he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, his heart will be glad. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you what you shall do. He indeed shall speak for you to the people. He shall serve as a mouth for you, and you shall serve as God for him. Take in your hand this staff with which you shall perform the signs.
Got to get set up here with my pregnancy preaching pose. <clears throat> I learned last time sitting in a chair is magical. However, I can't turn as easily to see the choir, so I'm sorry. <laughs> so today we have one of the most recognizable scenes in the whole Bible. And it's probably up there with the birth of Jesus, the creation story, Moses parting the Red Sea to help the Hebrew people escape. Spoiler alert, sorry. Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. It's a very memorable scene. But today we aren't focusing so much on Moses coming across this burning bush, but what happens immediately after. So Moses has received his call from God. And it is a doozy, my friends. God has heard the cries of the Israelites who are slaves in Egypt. And these Israelites, they are descendants of Jacob and all of his sons, including Joseph. And this generation produces tons of children and descendants. And generations later, it's an incredible population of people. Until one day, the Pharaoh says, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase. And in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. And so now these Israelites are enslaved and oppressed, working and living in unlivable conditions, valued only for their productivity. And God has heard their cries of misery and intends to deliver them, to free them and liberate them, to take them to the land of Canaan. And here God comes down to Moses and God asks Moses to go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. And we learn in our passage that Moses has issues speaking. And the word slow in our NRSV translates as heavy or great. And great can mean numerous or heavy, meaning dull or hard, difficult or burdensome, like a heavy yoke. What's interesting is it's the same word used to describe Pharaoh's heart later in the chapter but that time, it implies that his heart is stubborn or hardened. And so many scholars have tried to interpret what this particular speech issue is, that it could mean a stutter or a speech disability. It could mean Moses had trouble speaking the Egyptian language, perhaps. There's a midrash that... Moses burned his tongue on a hot coal as a child, and it deformed his mouth. It could mean he had processing issues and really struggled speaking under pressure. And in Exodus 6, 12, Moses' speech problem is mentioned again. But Moses spoke to the Lord, the Israelites have not listened to me. Why should Pharaoh listen to me, poor speaker that I am? And again, he mentions it in verse 28 of that chapter. And it can start to feel a little bit like deja vu. And so this cause story, it comes with some heavy baggage. Moses has issues. And he has a perpetual crisis of confidence. And a lot of it is centered around his ability to bring a word from God through speaking. And so Moses, rightly so, asks God for some insurance or some armor to help with this impossible and quite large undertaking. And he's not fully agreed to it yet, but God gives him these three major miracles to demonstrate God's power and to show Moses' connection to God. So his staff can turn into a snake and back again into a staff. And his hand can become white as snow and diseased. And then his flesh can return to a normal appearance. 
And if those two things don't work, he can take some water from the Nile, pour it on the ground, and it will turn to blood. But Moses has a lot of questions and questioning in this exchange with God. So do you remember the Advent story of Zechariah who questioned the angelic messenger once that his wife Elizabeth would bear a son? He just questioned once and he becomes mute for nine months. And Moses gets to question God's judgment four times before God's anger is raised And perhaps God thought about making Moses mute, but then realized that would defeat the point of asking him to be a messenger of liberation. So four times through chapters three and four, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Then Moses answered, but look, they may not believe me or listen to me, but say, the Lord did not appear to you. But Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor even now that you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Finally, my favorite, O my Lord, please send someone else. (laughs) And then it says God's anger was kindled against Moses. And in my opinion, God was pretty patient with Moses. So there's some pretty serious self-doubt emerging in this passage. You know, Moses, he makes it very, very obvious that he is not feeling good about himself or this call from God. And probably every cell in his body fought against this call and his immediate reaction was a hard pass. So things like self-doubt, they emerge as we go through formative life experiences that are negative. And often self-doubt emerges to protect ourselves. And it remembers these unpleasant negative experiences that came about from our mistakes. And I will say that These negative memories that linger in the brain really come about not from our mistakes, but from the people around us, parents, guardians, friends, leaders, who had an unhealthy attitude towards mistakes and gave us false messages about making them. But our brains remember this, and it comes up with methods of protection and self-preservation And self-doubt is one of those methods. And it activates us to protect us. It wants to keep us safe, so it encourages us not to take risks. It reminds us of times before when we have not succeeded. It reminds us what people have said about our talents and gifts. And perhaps if it's really an overdrive, it will recall every humiliating and shameful thing we've ever gone through. Getting in that car accident or getting someone's name wrong when you address them or some public speaking incident where you really mess up your speech or not getting that job because you weren't whatever enough or maybe a cruel word that comes out of your mouth in a time of frustration or anger. Or maybe you throw up in school because you were nervous about a test. Maybe getting in an argument with a relative and you just don't have a quick enough comeback and they win the argument. Sharp or harsh words from a mentor that you care about. Publishing an error in a church newsletter that goes out to over 400 households. And these things are often completely unrelated to the very thing that made us spiral into doubt in the first place. We know a few pivotal moments of Moses' life that surely made self-doubt a loud voice in his head. We know he was born in a time of slaughtering firstborn Hebrew sons as commanded by Pharaoh, who was threatened by the growing population and ordered midwives to kill the sons when they were born. And our text 
tells us that the midwives feared God, so they let the boys live. Telling Pharaoh that, you know, these Hebrew women, they just give birth so vigorously, they, they, they didn't get there in time to kill the boys. And I'm picturing these midwives, Shipra and Pua, who know that Pharaoh does not know squat about giving birth and telling him this, and he's just nodding like, yeah, of course, of course. And they also know he would never stay for a birth to find this out or make sure that they're telling the truth. So because of the midwives' faithfulness and cleverness, Moses survives. And because of his birth mother's cleverness, who hid him in a basket on the Nile until Pharaoh's daughter found him, and because of his sister who suggested to the daughter that there's this wonderful woman who can be his wet nurse, Moses' mom, he was raised by his own mother in the Pharaoh daughter's household. And so Moses grew up divided between two cultures. And one culture was dominant and powerful and it enslaved the other culture because they were afraid of the Hebrews' power. And I'm sure he struggled immensely with guilt. And perhaps the most damaging moment in his life was the murder of an Egyptian while trying to protect a Hebrew slave. And this Egyptian was beating this slave mercilessly and Moses kills him. And the NRSV is very straightforward. and doesn't give much context around this, just that Moses hid the body in the sand. But murder is a massive life event, something that really rips your soul into pieces. And it's a symbolic murder in a way because Moses is stirred with rage at this Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave. And his anger is kindled at Pharaoh and the Egyptian people who oppress the Hebrews. And his anger is raging at this system he's living in. And he feels immensely guilty for being a Hebrew who grows up Egyptian and he just goes blind with rage. And there are witnesses to this who the next day ask Moses if he will kill them too. And our text tells us that Pharaoh finds this out and intends to kill Moses, and Moses flees. And he's not just fleeing east, but he's running away from his crime. He's running away from this identity of being a murderer, of being an Egyptian who is really a Hebrew. And it leaves him with a total lack of faith and trust in himself and his choices. And I'm fairly certain that it scarred him so badly that he was perfectly content to spend the entire rest of his life as a shepherd, quietly tending his flock, and the only risks that he would take is facing off with some animal trying to hunt his sheep. Thinking about the task that God gave Moses, yes, it's a big one, and yes, it kind of came out of nowhere, there's no denying that, and it's perfectly normal for Moses to be afraid of changing his life and returning to Egypt. Although many, many years have passed since then and that Pharaoh that wanted him dead is now deceased. But Moses's reaction, it's on another level. Like his reaction is of someone who's been living in this really thick cloud of self-doubt for years. Someone who really does not think highly of themselves. Someone who can't really hide their nerves out of respect for the one true God and God's choices. I think even God was trying to talk to him and thinking, shoot, he's worse off than I thought. And there seems to be an unspoken expectation that Moses carries with him. That God expects perfection from Moses. And there's no way that Moses' gifts and abilities would ever be good enough for anybody. The truth is, God never expected perfection from Moses. And yet there is an attitude coming from Moses 
that God is calling him to complete this calling perfectly. That Moses' flaws and past mistakes would never make him the best candidate to be a prophet for the Hebrew people. It's these expectations in this misguided view of self that completely cloud Moses to why he'd be so great for the job. He grew up as a Hebrew in an Egyptian household. His identity is in both camps. He knows the ins and the outs of both cultures, and he seems to have a passion for justice and for what is right. I'm not saying his act of murder was ever okay, but his sense of compassion and justice for the Hebrew people is there. But Moses can't see that. His self-doubt has been in overdrive for such a long time. And remember how I said that self-doubt is a preservation technique, something our brains adapt to protect us. In our journey to wholeness and wellness, it often involves learning to engage with this self-doubt and our mistakes in a healthy way. And since self-doubt emerges as a way to protect yourself, it's good to talk to it and remind it that it doesn't need to protect you in this instance. The only way I've managed to have a healthy relationship with my self-doubt, and most days I'm not sure if I can call it that, but the only way is to befriend my self-doubt. Sometimes I tell my self-doubt, I literally talk to it, I say, it's okay, thank you for trying to protect me but I got this. And as for Christians, there is a whole other level to reckon with here. A God who expects perfection. And despite the harsh God that is very often painted in our Old Testament, I strongly, strongly believe God does not expect perfection from us. And I strongly believe that God desires us to find healthy ways to deal with our mistakes. And that our past mistakes are not the measuring stick in what we should be using to assess if God can use us in the future. And in the same way, God desires us to treat humanity in the same way. So this, is, this can be a tricky belief for those of us who were raised with a theology that depicts us humans as sinful, wretched creatures. And it's a double whammy if you were also raised in a family system that did not allow mistakes either. Or perhaps that's how you felt in your school environment with your teachers or professors. And when a message comes from both your religious and your secular world, that is a potent and formative combination for you to spiral when you make a mistake. Or when your gifts and capabilities are not quite what you hoped them to be. And there's a reason that a lot of Christians have to rewire their brains towards grace and belovedness through therapy, and affirmations. But hear me say this, if you walk away with anything today, God does not expect God's people to be perfect. Yes, God desires our hearts to be turned towards God. God desires our presence. God desires us to know when we've done something wrong and we need to return to God. But I say this with passion and assurance, our creator does not desire perfection. You know, God did not want imperfect people involved in God's gospel work. God would not be constantly reaching for a relationship with humanity. God calls and uses imperfect people all the time. Just read our Bible to find out. Sarah Wolf, who is a professor at Jewish Theological Seminary, 
she has a theology towards Moses' speech issues that I really love. And she writes, being created in God's image then does not mean that humans are endowed with some kind of divine perfection, but rather that humans are granted both abilities and disabilities, and that this mirrors something essential about the divine as well. And it may seem strange to consider God as having a disability, perhaps even a kind of speech impediment, yet this is also a potentially powerful way to conceptualize a God who gave the Torah through a revelation that was incomplete and in need of human interpretation. To be godly then, as well as to be human, is to have both power and limitations, to be both abled and disabled. In that case, a prophet with a speech impediment is not a person with a flaw to be overcome, but rather the truest representation of the divine voice, end quote. Isn't that a lovely theology? Suggesting that perhaps it is our imperfections, our flaws, our unique struggles, when combined with the call of God, becomes the most beautiful image of the divine. When we let self-doubt be the loudest voice, to be our main filter for how we make decisions, we are not truly living into what God calls us to do. And like Moses, we will just say no four different times to a job that actually fits us really well. If we give ourselves faith and trust to grow into it. And self-doubt, while protecting us, it also separates us a little further from the radical freeing truth that we are loved just as we are. And the gifts that we have, they're just what the world needs. The gifts that you have is just what the world needs. Often what God calls us to is tremendously scary. I think there's always some level of stepping outside our comfort zone that's involved in following God's call. You know, when God originally called me to ministry and then called me to preach, for an introvert to give her thoughts in front of a bunch of people, my response was, are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> I moved to a new city, totally out of my element, studying theology with a bunch of Southern kids who have theology degrees. And I felt that way again when God called me to preach at Calvary for the first time after a traumatic preaching experience of having a seizure during a sermon and hitting my head on the altar table at my husband's former church. And pretty much every time those nerves are there, I've been nauseous all morning. You're welcome. <laughs> Walking in wellness means not letting our self-doubt be the loudest voice. Perhaps thanking it for protecting you, but reminding it that it can relax. It means working towards a way of knowing that we, that our mistakes do not paralyze us. And working towards maybe embracing those mistakes, those flaws of ours. Perhaps we can go so far as to see our flaws as part of our divine image. How amazing would that be? Sometimes this means ignoring those in our lives who have unhealthy views towards mistakes. Walking in wellness means that God embraces you and calls you. 
all parts of you. May it be so, and may you truly believe it. Amen.